October the 7th changed everything. The way we think of ourselves and how others see us as Jews. Our vulnerability, both in Israel and indeed the diaspora. The images and testimonies of what happened on that day are impossible to erase. Beautiful young people, one minute dancing at a music festival, the next living out the worst nightmares imaginable. The sheer barbarism that we have not witnessed as people since the Holocaust. Those ordinary kibbutzniks, many of whom made it their life's work to seek peace with their Palestinian neighbors, butchered in their homes. And then, of course, the indiscriminate snatching of hostages, the elderly, some just babies, entire families. And I'd like to say it is amazing to see so many of you here today, so many friends and allies, because it's been a very hard year. For many of us, people we regarded as our friends, our colleagues, our neighbors, their deafening silence in the days after the attack was shocking. It hurt. But a positive out of all of this horror is that it has brought us as a community closer together. We truly are globally one people and now more than ever. We have used the words never again to commemorate the slaughter of six million Jews across Europe in the Holocaust. Today, a lot of the world seems to have forgotten and some even deny the barbaric massacres that took place a year ago and to ignore the men, women and children held in horrific conditions for nearly over a year. We are here to bear witness. You will not forget because we will not let you forget. We are here today and it's about remembering. Remembering those who were murdered, those who survived with life-changing psychological and physical wounds, and of course the hostages who we hold in our hearts and think about every single day. To my left, you will see images on the screen. These are the photos of those that were murdered on October the 7th. We will broadcast images of each of over the 1,200 people whose lives were taken from us on that day to allow us to remember them. Today is memorial. Today is remembering. May their memories be a blessing. Thank you. I'd like to invite Phil Rosenberg, the president of the Board of Deputies, to say a few words now. Thank you, Tracy Ann. A year ago tomorrow, the world changed. We all remember where we were when we heard the terrible news how Hamas had murdered, raped, burned, and kidnapped their way through the towns of southern Israel. They even attacked a music festival. 1,200 people killed, murdered, men, women, and children, thousands injured, 250 taken into cruel captivity by Hamas terrorists in Gaza. Most of us here today will know people who lost family or friends on October the 7th. We'll be hearing from some of them later on. But for them and for all of us, it is October the 7th every single day. We share that pain. And as their yacht site approaches, we remember them. May their memories be for a blessing. There's particular excruciating agony for the 101 people still held captive in Gaza and we say as one today, bring them home, bring them home, bring them home, bring them home.
Everybody here knows that the period since October 7th has seen the highest levels of anti-Semitism that we have seen in most of our lifetimes. And what's really shocking, friends, is that that anti-Semitism rose most sharply in the immediate aftermath of 7th October, before Israel went into Gaza. We learned something here that's very serious, but very important. They didn't hate us because they thought Israel was strong, because Israel wasn't strong in those days. They hated us because they thought Israel was weak. We see them, we know who they are, and we will stand together to confront them. Because friends, 710 is like 77. The attack on the Nova Music Festival is like the attack on the Manchester Arena. Terror is terror, and we must confront it together and stand together and stand together as we do today. Of course, we mourn the deaths of all the innocents in Gaza and Lebanon. And we know that the fundamental responsibility for their deaths lies with the terrorist organizations, Hamas, Hezbollah, and their puppet masters in Tehran, who have used them as human shields behind whom they've conducted their campaigns to destroy Israel. The major difference between us and our enemies is that while they support terror, we pray for peace. A peace in which Israelis and Palestinians, the wider region, can live side by side in dignity and security. Yeah. I know that this has been an incredibly tough year. But we, the Jewish people, have resilience in our DNA. And I know, I am determined, that we will come back stronger. We have come through the pogroms. We have come through the Holocaust. We have come through 7th October, and we are still standing. The people of Israel lives. Am Yisrael Chai! 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 I'm Yisrael Chai! I'm Yisrael Thank you, Shana Tova, and I'm Yisrael Chai! Can you hear us at the back? I'm told the mics are really low. They've turned them up. Can you hear? Can you hear at the back? No, not loud enough. Can you hear us at the back? Okay, good. Um, I am honoured to introduce uh, Her Excellency Ms. Zippy Hotlevy, the Ambassador of Israel to the Court of St. James. Everyone remembers where they were at the 7th of October. Last year, celebrating Simchat Torah, prepared with the nice white dresses for my girls. I was about to go to the synagogue, but everyone remembers how it ended. 6.30 in the morning, I was in Israel, and the first alarm came. 8 o'clock, the second alarm came, and we all realized something really bad is happening. We got the news about the atrocities of Hamas, about over 1,200 Israelis and people coming from all around the world, including British citizens, were butchered, raped, killed in the most barbaric way. That was a moment of darkness in our life. We've been through the hardest year in Israel's history. But just like Phil said a few minutes before I spoke, the Jewish people always recover and always become stronger from every moment of crisis. At May 2000 was a famous speech in Binj Bell in Lebanon. The name of the speech is the spider web speech. It was carried by someone you all know, 
and he's not here with us for anymore. His name is Hassan Nasrallah. Hassan Nasrallah was claiming that Israel is a strong country by technology and military abilities, but the Israelis are as weak as a spider web. And he kept on saying, Israel will never survive a military attack because the Israelis are spoiled and the Israelis are weak and the Israelis are so weak, they are like a spider web. Now the year is 2024 and we know where Hassan Nasrallah is, dead. And we know where Israel is, Am Israel Chai. What the Israeli people have shown to the world throughout this year, that we are strong, we are resilient. The people that left their families to fight in Gaza are now the people that are leaving their families to fight in Lebanon. There are soldiers, men and women, brave people that left their babies, left their work, their businesses, just for one reason, to make sure that Israel will always be there for the Jewish people. And Israel today is stronger than ever, and the Israeli people are stronger than ever. And we are here united with the Jewish people here in London, in Hyde Park, to say to our enemies, every time you want to defeat us, we become stronger. Every time you want to divide us, we become more united because, and I'm quoting here, Navi Shmuel, Netzach Israel lo yeshaker. We will always prevail on our enemies and we will see the 101 hostages coming back home because we will never forget them. And very soon we will hear Mandy Damari speaking about her daughter, Emily. And we will hear Barak Derry that almost died by trying to rescue the hostages. We will do whatever we can to bring them home. Bring them home. Bring them home. Bring them home. Israel today is strong and Israel will prevail. Am Israel Chai. We stand here as a community joined together with our allies. And we're so grateful that we are here to remember because today is a day of remembrance, and I am honored to introduce Chief Rabbi Sir Ephraim Mervis to speak next. The prophet Jeremiah declared, Al Ele Ani Vachia, for these I weep. Aini, aini, yoradamayim. Tears run uncontrollably down my face. Our Jewish tradition demands that we forever remember our tragedies of the past. And that is why today is the fast of Gedalia. But our prophets also told us that in the course of time, the saddest days on our calendar will be transformed to be the happiest. And the reason is, Odlo Avda Tikvatenu. We are a nation which shall forever have hope. Al Eile Anivochia. Today we weep for 1,200 women, men, and children brutally murdered exactly a year ago. Al Eile Anivochia. We weep for 251 hostages taken so cruelly from their homes, 101 of which still have not returned home. And concerning them, we shall never stop declaring, bring them home now. Today, we weep for a nation which has existed in a state of anxiety and trauma for the past year. During the festival of Sukkot last year, we left our permanent homes to go into a temporary abode and more than 70,000 have not yet returned to their permanent homes. 
Al Ele Anivochia, today we weep for so many soldiers who have fallen in battle, and Al Ele Anivochia, we weep today for so many innocent civilians in Israel, in Gaza, in Lebanon. Every human life is precious, and we weep as we acknowledge the depths of depravity to which Hamas and Hezbollah have sunk, placing their own people in harm's way. But at the same time, right now, we have tikva. We have hope. We have hope because Jews right around the world stand in solidarity with the state of Israel. And it is so critically important that we continue to provide our unequivocal support for Medinat Yisrael. We have hope today because we are not alone. Israel's not alone. The Jewish people's not alone. And right now, I would like to particularly welcome to this gathering all the non-Jews who are here as our good friends to support us. Thank you very much. Today, we have hope because Israel is strong. Right now, we are not living in the 1930s nor in the 1920s. We're living in 2024 when we have Medinat Israel, a country which will forever place the welfare and security of its citizens as its top priority, a country which will forever be a safe haven for Jews from around the world. But most of all, we have hope today, because despite the fact that and every generation there are those who seek to annihilate us, HaKadosh Baruch Hu Matzileinu Adam, Almighty God, saves us from their hands. And as a result, Am Yisrael Chai. Regardless of what happens, the Jewish people will continue to live on in strength. So therefore, while we weep today for the events of a year ago, we are filled with hope and promise for a safe, happy, peaceful, and secure future. May that come speedily in our time. Ose shalom bim romav, hu yase shalom aleinu, ve'al kol Yisrael ve'imaru. Amen. Sarit, Alishuve, 
מדינת ישראל ולנשמות חיילי צבא הגנה לישראל שוטרי משטרת ישראל ואנשי כוחות הביטחון שמסרו נפשם על קדושת השם ונפלו מות גיבורים על הגנת העם והארץ שאנו מתפללים לעילוי נשמותיהם בגן עדן תהא מנוחתם לכן בא יסתירם בסתר כנפיו לעולמים ויינוחו בשלום על משכבותם ויעמדו לגורלם לקץ הימים I'm very honored to welcome our next speaker. Mandy Damari is the mother of the only remaining British hostage, Emily Damari, age 28. Born and raised not far from South London, Mandy met her husband on a volunteering trip to Israel in her 20s. She fell in love and she never left. She has lived in Kibbutz Kafar Aza for over 30 years. Until the 7th of October, she lived there with her four children and her four grandchildren and worked as a nursery school teacher on the kibbutz, teaching English in her spare time. On the 7th of October, her life was turned upside down. Emily, at the time 27, was kidnapped by Hamas early on the morning of October the 7th. I am honored to ask Mandy to address you all. Um. Thank you for coming. Sorry, it's raining. Um, I hope you've got umbrellas. Um, before I begin, I'd just like to extend my heartfelt thanks to everyone involved in organizing this event and to each of you who has taken time to be here today. Your presence is a testament to the support and solidarity and compassion that sustains us during this challenging time. And I'm deeply grateful. I'm Mandy Damari, and I come from South London, went to school here and was raised with the great British ideals of pubs, parties and freedom. And that freedom led me to Israel in my 20s, where I met my Israeli husband, fell in love and moved to a kibbutz, where we in turn raised four children, four grandchildren with slightly different values, but freedom was the most important of all freedom to think, to speak, and to live fully. 
But today I'm here because my daughter, Emily, a British Israeli woman, is no longer free to do any of these things. Emily is 20 years old, full of life with dual nationality, British and Israeli. She's a daughter of both countries, but no one here mentions the fact that there is a still, there's still a female British hostage being held captive by Hamas for a year now. And I sometimes wonder if people even know there is a British woman here. There, sorry. <laughs> Imagine for a moment, if Emily was your daughter, try to picture what she is going through. Since the 7th of October last year, she has been held a hostage by Hamas terrorists in the Gazan terror tunnels, 20 meters or more underground, kept in captivity, tortured, isolated, unable to eat, speak or even move without someone else's permission, stripped of every human right. It's almost impossible to compre comprehend her pain, yet it's the reality she is living every single day. Emily's love for life was contagious. She adored coming to visit her family here and seeing her granddad. She had the classic British sense of humor with a dash of Israeli chutzpah thrown in for good measure. She loved British music, and we even went to see Ed Sheeran the year before she was taken hostage. When she was young, her favorite place was London Zoo, not far from here. As she got older, she turned into a big foodie, always dragging us to her favorite restaurants. We go shopping in Primark and visit markets for a good bargain. She went to see Spurs, who she loved, cheering them on in their new stadium with her brother, and she loved going to the pub. For her, that was England, and she loved her second home across the sea and always looked forward to coming here. Now, all of that joy and that light is locked away. One year has passed, and she's still in hell. On the morning of the 7th of October, Emily was in her own apartment on Kfar Azza, our peaceful kibbutz. But that day, Hamas turned our home into a place of terror. 64 of our neighbors, men, women, children, and elderly, were sadistically murdered. 19 were kidnapped. 12 women were eventually released. Two of our hostages were killed in friendly fire. There were 12 women and children, not just 12 women, while trying to escape. And five are still in Gaza, including my Emily. My beautiful charismatic daughter with a cheeky smile was shot and taken by force from her home. Her beloved dog Chucha was with her, was killed with a gunshot to the neck. Emily was taken bleeding from her hand to Gaza by Hamas Nakba terrorists who blindfolded her and forced her into her own car with two other friends, the twins, Gali and Zeev Berman. I know from the women and children who came back last November when the ceasefire deal was reached that Emily was alive. They told me that some of them had met her while they were being moved around, some for short periods, some for longer. But they all told me about her bravery and courage and even her laughter and the way she helped hold everyone together, even in the worst times. One even said she sang a song every morning called Bokesh al Kef, which means it's a great morning, despite the darkness. It reminded me of the stories her friends have told me since about how she was always smiling, funny, the glue that held them all together, who they always went to for good advice, or who was always the first to arrange a party or celebration for them, and how she always kept up their spirits in her optimistic and hopeful way. But who knows? I'm sure she's not singing now. I keep thinking of the six hostages that were murdered hours before they were discovered by the IDF, about Eden Yerushalmi, who weighed just 32 kilos. In the tunnel they were kept in, there was no room to stand up in and hardly any air to breathe with just a bucket to relieve themselves in. How is it that she's still in prison there after one year? Why isn't the whole world, especially Britain, fighting every moment to secure her release? She's one of their own. Thank you. But her plight seems to have been forgotten. My beautiful, funny and brave daughter, who I love to the moon and back, deserves to come home. I need to hug her again, and I need to see her smile. 
I know we could and should be doing more and more. I and everyone else has failed her. And the only way to make us all feel whole again is to get Emily and all the 100 and hostages back to their families. I, <laughs> thank you. I have. She's not here. Not your fault she's not here. I've been talking here about my daughter, but each one of the hostages is someone's child, grandchild, parent or grandparent of many different nationalities and religions. They are real people with real families just like yours and mine. What would you do if your loved ones were held there? They are not just names of faces you see on a poster that you may or may not forget. They need to be released. The ones still living to be returned to their families and homes, and the ones murdered returned for a respectful burial. Every second counts for them. Every day is a living hell. Not knowing what Emily is going through, I do know from the hostages that returned that they were starved, sexually abused, and tortured. Every moment lost is another moment of unimaginable suffering or even death. Please, I ask of you all, and also the British government, do not let my daughter Emily Damari or the other innocent people held hostage continue to be tortured or even murdered. I employ those in power here to use every ounce of influence they have to advocate for the release of all the hostages and to secure the release of their UK citizen. We must all stand on the side of humanity, life, justice and freedom, and act with urgency and determination to obtain the release of Emily and the other 100 hostages now. Please help us to return them home before it's too late for them all. We must act now. I. I want to end by saying this, no matter how dark the days become, I still hold on to hope, like Emily always told me to do. Hope that there will be good news, hope that Emily and all the hostages will be returned home, and hope that the world will stand for justice and freedom. Thank you for listening, and I pray with you that we hear good news soon. Every word, every word. <clears throat> I have great pleasure in introducing Rabbi Charlie Baginski and Rabbi Josh Levy, co-leads of Progressive Judaism. Welcome to the stage. Many of us gathered in our communities on Thursday and Friday of last week to mark Rosh Hashanah. This afternoon, we also come together as a community for this memorial event, gathering in prayer, in memory, and in reflection. As we read our Torah readings for Rosh Hashanah this week, the stories of Abraham and Sarah, of Hagar, Isaac, and Ishmael, felt more acutely than ever as the continuing pain of an age-old conflict. Together this afternoon we pray that all of their descendants find within them the wisdom and strength to seek a peaceful resolution. And we ask God as we gather in this community for this strength for all of us too to be a source of peace. We recognize that all of us have a part to play in working to honor the words of Nachman of Bratslav. Let all the residents of earth recognize that we are not come into this world for quarrel and division, for hate and bloodshed, but to know God. As we read of our father Abraham, we recognize too that he was the first exemplar of the supreme Jewish value of Pidyon Shuvuyim, seeking in his days 
to release and redeem those in captivity. Every day since October 7 last year, we have held those taken hostage in our hearts, acknowledging the words spoken by Steve Brisley, the brother-in-law of one of the hostages, Eli Shurabi. We are them and they are us. How much more we are reminded of this hearing Mandy speak of her daughter, Emily. We are them and they are us. This constant challenge to not allow the hostages to be forgotten, to ensure that we remember that each one of their lives is not just words, but a whole world. And this has become a sacred task for all of us. We were asked in this moment of prayer to conclude with a prayer for the hostages. And in a moment, we'll recite a prayer for guarding, redeeming and freeing hostages written by Israeli Rabbi Chain ben Ortsfoni. This prayer is not simply a request of God, but a demand we make of ourselves, a challenge to us not to descend into indifference, to hold on to hope and not to despair, that we continue to think of them work for them, be a source of support for those who yearn for them, and to be a source of hope and vision for a better possible future for all of us. May the one who blessed our ancestors, Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebecca, Jacob, Rachel and Leah. May the one who answered Dina in her torture, Joseph in his prison, and Daniel in the lion's den, God of Abraham. First, who was willing to risk his life for the, re for the release of prisoners and hostages. May this God bless the hostages taken captive by our enemies and all those missing and unaccounted for, citizens, soldiers, men, women and children, all who are imprisoned and in grave danger. May it be your will, God of all, that they be released speedily and return to our land, to their families and to their homes, safe and sound in body and in spirit. Plant the power of hope in the hearts of their loved ones, frantic and yearning for their release. Grant wisdom in the hearts of those laboring for their release and compassion in the hearts of their captors. May God's presence spread mercy on them and save them from trouble to well-being, from darkness to light, from enslavement to redemption. May it be swift and soon. As it is written in Jeremiah, thus said God, a cry is heard in Ramah, wailing, bitter weeping. Rachel is weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted for her children who are gone. Thus said God, restrain your voice from weeping, your eyes from shedding tears, for there is reward in your labor, declares God. They shall return from the enemy's land. And let us say, Amen. Mandy Damari's words are still resonating in my heart and I'm sure it is with yours. And it encapsulates every reason of why we are here today. Please welcome to the stage now Henry Grunwald, OBEKC, Chair of the Memorial Event to the stage. Welcome, Henry. Friends, I cannot tell you what it's like to stand up here and see the thousands and thousands of you out there coming together as one community with our allies from outside the community to remember those who were so cruelly and brutally murdered on the 7th of October. And we want them to know that we remember them. We remember their souls. May their souls rest in the peace that they deserve. 
We want their families and friends to know that we remember them and that they will not be forgotten. And you've seen on the screens at each side of this stage the names of each of those 1,200 running on a loop. It takes just under an hour to get through all of those names. On October the 7th last year, a darkness descended, not only on the south of Israel, not only on the whole of Israel, it descended on all of us. And that darkness stays with us. There's one thing that can dispel darkness, and that is light. And we're now at that stage of this afternoon's memorial where we are going to light 23 candles. One candle for each of the communities, the institutions, the events that was so brutally dealt with on that day. And it's my pleasure to invite to light the first candle, Rabbi Dweck, the senior rabbi of the Spanish and Portuguese Sephardi community of the United Kingdom. Each candle lighter will in fact light two candles, and these two candles are lit in memory of Kibbutz Be'ari and Kibbutz Mefasim. The third and fourth candles will be lit by Rabbi Wittenberg, the senior rabbi of Mazalti Judaism. And they are lit in memory of Kibbutz Ein Hashlosha and Kibbutz Re'im. The fifth and sixth candles will be lit by Sami Berkov, the president of the Union of Jewish Students, and they're lit in memory of Kibbutz Kafar Aza and Kibbutz Nachal Oz. The seventh and eighth candle are lit by Lucy Ross, the Maskira of the Federation of Zionist Youth, and they're in memory of Kibbutz Kerem Shalom and Kibbutz Nir Yitzchak. The ninth and tenth candle are lit by Lockie Blankstone, the Rakezet of Habonim Dror, UK and they're lit in memory of the Nova Music Festival and Kibbutz Zikim. <laughs> the 11th and 12th candles are lit by Michal Benjamin, the Maskira of Bene Akiva UK, and they're lit in memory of Kibbutz Alumim, and Moshav Nativ Ha'asara.
candles 13 and 14 are lit by Vadim Blumin, the head of the delegation to the United Kingdom and Western Europe for the Jewish Agency. And they are lit in memory of Moshav Yakini and Nachal Oz Lookout. The 15th and 16th candle are lit by Chaya Lungerman of the Hostage Family Forum, and they are lit in memory of Kibbutz Nirim and of Ofakim. Candles 17 and 18 are lit by Itai Galmudi from the 710 Human Chain Project, and they're lit in memory of the Poseidok Music Festival and Sederot. The 19th and 20th candle are lit by Marla Tribic, a Holocaust survivor who has shown by her life since then the resilience which has led her to do what she continues to this day, that is to teach about the lessons of the Holocaust. And may her resilience be a witness and a lesson to all of us. We are blessed today with the presence amongst us of some survivors from the Nova Music Festival. But to light the 21st and 22nd candle, it is an honor to invite one of the hostages who was released in November, having been taken from her kibbutz near Oz on the 7th of October. And I'm going to invite Arda Sagi and her son Noam to come and light these two candles. May the remaining hostages be released to be with her family as Ada was being to be with hers. I light the last candle in memory of Kibbutz Keren Shalom. And as I do so, I ask those of you who have candles amongst you to please light them and raise them up as high as you can. I think there are 1,600 candles to be lit. And that's one for each of the 1,200 brutally murdered on the 7th of October, and another 400 who have died since then. May the light that these candles represent overcome the darkness that fell upon Am Yisrael on the 7th of October. And we hope and pray that the hostages will soon be released. Am Yisrael Chai.
sorry, like, like many of you, I'm sure I was overcome by the emotion of that. I'm going to ask you please now to mark a minute's silence in memory of all of those who were murdered on the 7th of October. Thank you. May their dear souls rest in peace and may the hostages all be released. Thank you. I'm delighted to introduce to the stage now a very Wonderful man, he's a dear friend and also hugely respected around the world, Sir Simon Sharma, one of our best. Sir Simon Sharma is a university professor of art, history and history at Columbia University. He's a contributing editor to the Financial Times, author of 20 books and writer and presenter of over 50 documentaries on art, history and literature for the BBC including the story of the Jews. Simon, please come to the stage. Sometimes the enormity of what happens to us, dear beloved Jews, is too much for speeches. Uh, and in our tradition, poets, have risen to the occasion. Uh, the first poet I know of who responded to calamity was Rabbi Meir of Norwich around the time that Jews were expelled from Britain in 1290, a heart-rending poem about light. We are the only culture where poets actually have become leaders. We think of Abba Kovne, Chaim Nachman Bialik, in the city of slaughter, and Avraham Sutskeva, all the heroes, poets of action. So I want to read you some poems that I think actually weep and feel and pulse with the immensity of this terrible, awful, challenging, inspiring moment in Jewish history. The first poem is by a young Israeli poet whose name is Dael Rodriguez Garcia, and the poem is called Cleared for Publication. Cleared for Publication, many of you will know, is the phrase used when broadcasters in Israel are able to announce the name of someone who has fallen in the army because it's assumed it is known that their families already know cleared for publication that our hearts are broken and in hidden places in empty rooms thousands of sobs are choking silently cleared for publication that open season was declared on us we were plundered in the dark of the most precious of the precious it is already cleared for publication that the magical shining light of our beloved's face is extinguished. However, beneath the same soil, a stubborn plant is sprouting, sending roots without end, tightly grasped with love. Here is a poem 
by one of Israel's most magnificent poets, someone I knew, I was lucky to know just a little, Yehuda Amichai. Not the peace of a ceasefire, not even the vision of the wolf and the lamb, but rather as in the heart when the excitement is over and you can only talk about a great weariness. I know that I know how to kill. That makes me an adult and my son plays with a gun that knows how to open and close its eyes and say, Mama, a peace without the big noise of beating swords into plowshares, without words, without the thud of the heavy rubber stamp. Let it be light, floating like lazy white foam. A little rest for the wounds who speaks of healing. And the howl of the orphans is passed from one generation to the next, as in a relay race, the baton never falls. Let it come, the wild peace. And last of all, a poem also by Yehuda Amichai, which to me has always spoken about the unbroken love between the diaspora and Israel, and the love of both of them, the bond between, of both of them with our past, the past that will always go in the future. And appropriately, Yehuda Amichai calls the poem a poem without end, Ein Sof, which as you'll all know, is also the name for the Almighty given in the Kabbalah. Yehuda Amichai, poem without end. Inside the brand new museum, there's an old synagogue. Inside the synagogue is me. Inside me, my heart. Inside my heart, a museum. Inside the museum, a synagogue. Inside it, me. Inside me, my heart. Inside my heart, a museum. Tadaraba.
I have great pleasure in introducing Barak Derry. On October the 7th, he was one of the first soldiers into Kibbutz Be'eri. In December 2023, Barak took part in a special mission to rescue hostages. After a long and fierce battle with Hamas terrorists, unfortunately the mission failed and Barak was critically injured. His condition was so bad that doctors declared that he wouldn't survive the helicopter ride to the hospital. But eventually the hospital treatment did save his life. After nine months of tough recovery, Barak's spirit is still strong and he is here with us today. Please welcome Barak Derry. He's a hero. Hello, everyone. Thank you. It's an honor to speak with you all today. Despite still being in recovery at the hospital, it was important for me to come here and to share my story. We are in crucial time for our nation past, present, and future, and this has a great significance for me. On October 7, I was at home in Tel Aviv. It was a typical Saturday morning, and my coffee tasted the same as always. Then, I received messages from three of my brothers. We are a family of five boys, and three of them were at the Nova party down south. The messages were messages of goodbye. One of them was badly injured, and the other two were running from terrorist bullets. I rushed to my reserve unit and joined the first available team. We headed towards my injured brother location. Midway there, one of the commanders turned to me. He said, Barak, we are not going to save your brothers. Something huge is happening, something we've never seen before in all the towns near the Gaza borders. We need to save as many families as possible. We are heading to Kibbutz Be'eri. For me, it was a moment of decision. My family, my blood, or others. I could argue my way to my brothers, but I understood the situation. <sighs> this moment will stay with me forever, as I had to accept the thought that I might lose them. But in Israel, unity comes first. I wiped my tears and kept going with the team towards Kibbutz Be'eri. In the Kibbutz, I saw death. Children, women, men, Elderly people, ordinary unarmed civilians lying dead in the streets or in their homes, in their living rooms, in their child bedrooms. Entire families were slaughtered, many with knives. During an intensive firefight from day to night, we killed many terrorists, but I also lost friends, some of whom died in my arms. I used to think this kind of horrors only happens in movies but it was real. That day, my heart shattered. It pushed me into war. A just war for our right to live. What I learned from the Holocaust during high school was the phrase, never again. And it was now happening again. We searched for the hostages location in Gaza, trying to bring peace to their families, but often we returned only with bodies. In December, during a hostage rescue operation, I was severely injured. A grenade exploded next to me, and I was shot several times after hitting the ground. 
somehow I was able to be stabilized in the hospital and began my long journey into recovery. But the injury changed my life. I found my purpose in helping others suffering with what I have suffered. I learned resilience, not just for myself, but for us as nation, for us as Jews, for us as people who look for freedom all around the globe. I realized that life is short and many of the things that we are stressed about aren't important in the end. And I learned what is true meaning of being free. The horrific event from October 7 until today have been a harsh reminder that our freedom is not granted. Standing together with empathy is our greatest strength and ally. We will never forget October 7. We will pray for those still suffering in captivity and mourn those who lost their lives so we can keep breathing. David Mayer, a team friend of mine, was dying in my hands. But I know this, he always said that we will be stronger. I believe with all my heart that despite all the darkness, there will be light in the future. We will grow as a nation, as people, we will be stronger. Thank you all for coming here today, it's my honor. Barack, I promise you on behalf of everybody here today, none of this will have been in vain. We stand together stronger, full of love as a community and full of love for each other. None of it will be in vain. I'm delighted to introduce Keith Black, the chair of the Jewish Leadership Council. Keith. Thank you, Tracy. I have two final messages for today. My first message is to Israel and to its citizens. Our community has been overwhelmed with grief and with sadness at all that you have endured over the last 12 months. Every day we wake with the reality of the nightmare that you are living through, the dreadful plight of the hostages, the fear of incoming attack, and the tragedy of young life lost with so much yet to offer heartbreakingly lost defending our beloved Israel. The battle you are fighting, Israel, is not solely for the state of Israel. It is not even solely for the Jewish people. It is at its core a battle against a malignant, evil ideology that wishes to bring down the entire structure of Western civilization. You are fighting for liberty, for pluralism, for a set of values that are the foundations of the West. You are fighting for the future of hundreds and hundreds of millions of people. And that message is too often lost by those who should know better, but are so blinded by their liberalism that they become illiber illiberal in their prejudice, discriminatory in their choice of victim, and fundamentally dishonest in their pious self-righteousness. Maybe, maybe had it, it has always been this way. Maybe the fight for freedom against dark savagery has always depended on a small minority and maybe too often in history it has been the Jews who have fallen victim first. Well this time the Jews are able to fight back. 
And my simple message to that brave, that valiant and resourceful country is one of enormous pride. As our religion depends on love, so does our loyalty. And in that, you will not find us lacking. My second message is to our community here today. Yes, we too are in the fight of our lives. We have never experienced the level of anti-Semitism we're witnessing. We've never experienced this level of hatred and vilification. Fortunately, we have a very strong communal infrastructure full of experienced professionals and leaders who are deeply connected and coordinated. And we are organizing ourselves to defend this community with every sinew we have. And we will remain resilient, determined, optimistic, and brave. This country, this country has looked after us for several hundred years. And it is my belief that it will continue to do so long into the future. And it will do so because our values are aligned. We will seek out allies and friends. We will defend ourselves politically and legally. We will support and educate our next generation. And we will make our voice heard. And as I look out today amongst this amazing crowd, 20, 30,000 people, I know that we will rise to whatever is asked of us. Thank you. I, hello, hello. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome to the stage now Michal Noe, the co-chair of the event, with some words for us. Thank you, Michal. The connection between the UK and Israel goes back generations from Montefiore, Herzog, Weizmann and the Balfour Declaration to every one of you standing here today. Ever since the idea of the modern Jewish state was envisioned, British Jews have stood shoulder to shoulder with their people in Israel. With their love and support, who can forget the ubiquitous blue metal boxes that we all saw growing up in our parents' and grandparents' home? We have always been proud of our deep and enduring connection to the Jewish homeland. And nowhere is this bond deeper than with our youth and our children, the most idealistic and committed, the loudest and the proudest. And today, more than ever, that connection thrives. The past year has been difficult beyond imagining, but it has also brought us closer together. Children in the UK and Israel bonding over their shared identity, Jewish heritage, and their love of Israel. To celebrate this connection, I am delighted to introduce Sev Hamburger and Danielle Blooming Kogan. Danielle is in year eight and will be reading out a letter by Guy Fatok, age 13. He and his family were evacuated from Kiryat Shmona in the north of Israel a year ago, and he has not been home since. Guy participates in a UJA-supported after-school program in Netanya, where he now lives in a hotel room with his parents and siblings. Zev Hamburger who lives in London, will read out a letter he wrote to his friend Liel, currently living in Israel. Shalom. My name is Guy. My name is Guy and I'm in year nine. For the past year, I have been... Oh. Okay. 
For the past year, I've been evacuated to Natanya and I live in a hotel room in town. This past year, I've spent a lot of time at the Shluk. This is a daily after school club for us kids who have been evacuated. Going there makes me feel safe and secure, even when I know my home in the north of Israel is under rocket fire every day. This place is the only place where I can express my feelings and at the same time spend time with my friends who have also been evacuated because we understand what each other because we understand what each other are going through. Since we had to evacuate at home. I've been living in one room with my parents, brothers and dog. So I really like going to a place like the Shluk where I can meet new people. And I hope that the people from the Shluk will continue to help me during this new year, even when we go back home and start to rebuild our lives. Thank you, uh, thank you all of you in Britain who have been provided this extra support for me and my friends after October 7th. Toda raba and shana tova, love, Guy. Dear Liel, we were born a month apart in New York and a year later my family moved back to London and yours made Aliyah. Last October 7th was your bat mitzvah, but instead of dancing and celebrating with your friends and family, you spent the day in a bomb shelter and the next day donated the food that was meant for your party to those who needed it more. I remember hearing the news about Israel, but this time things were different. That Sunday night, as I helped my dad take down our sukkah, instead of putting away the Israeli flag, we put it up in our hallway, where it has remained since. On that Monday morning, when I went to Shachra at my school, not only did all the Jewish students show up, but our non-Jewish headmaster put a kippah on his head and sat quietly at the back of the classroom as a show of support. Our Israeli cousins were called up to the army and we were both proud of and worried about them from afar. I joined my family on marches and rallies, calling to bring the hostages home where we would wave flags, sing songs and hold up posters. Each week in Shul, we take time to pause, remember and pray for the Chaya Lim and hostages. When we light our Shabbat candles, there are pictures of hostages we have in mind and on Yom Hazikaron, we lit candles at our Shul and remember those who have fallen. One memorable moment was on B'nai Akiva summer camp in August when some Israelis led a tekes, a programme, about friends they had lost and their experience since the war started. Lots of people were crying as hearing these personal stories were very moving. Liel, I heard you ended up having a postponed bat mitzvah party where your friends made sandwiches for Chayalim and then danced, sang and finally celebrated. Next month is my bar mitzvah, where I plan to lean from the Torah and celebrate too. Because even though this past year has been so very sad for many people, it has been amazing to witness how Jews around the world not only love and support Israel, but are so proud of who we are and the community we are part of. Liel, I'm looking forward to when we and our families can next meet up in person. Take care for now. Zev. Thank 
Uh, let's welcome to the stage Svi Noe, the chairman of the UJIA. There we go, sorry, it wasn't on the paper. Chairman of the UJIA, big round of applause, please. Thank you. Looking out at the size of this incredible crowd. Give yourself a round of applause. It's been a long day. One might be surprised. 30,000 people from across the community who've made the extreme effort to be here this afternoon to remember, to mourn, and to commemorate. But this does not surprise me, because today is a microcosm of the reaction of our community to October 7th. It does not surprise me because our community has been responding since we first heard the whispers of the horrific news on the morning of Simchat Torah 12 months ago. But when we were asked to stand and counted, we stood. We did not cower. We did not hide. We stood. We showed solidarity. We raised our heads high. We raised our voices and we raised our support. We prayed countless tefillot. We sent thousands of suitcases. We've attended rallies and demonstrations. And we've raised millions of pounds for Israelis in need, providing trauma relief, medical care and vital necessities for tens of thousands of evacuated Israelis, including food, clothing, schools, clubs for displaced young people. And we are helping rebuild the communities of the South as they begin to return home and continue to support the needs of communities still evacuated from Northern Israel. When the clarion call, the shofar cry of Israel needs you, 
sounded out across the Jewish world, we, the UK community, ran towards that call. We've got on planes and visited, from old to young, on solidarity missions, on volunteering trips, and on educational summer programs, such as Israel Tour and Birthright. And all this in the midst of a war. Because what we do here in the UK matters, not just to ourselves, but also to our massive family in Israel. And I say to you as we stand here today with broken hearts, that we must continue to be proud. We must continue to be active in our communities and to stand in solidarity with our brothers and sisters, our family in Israel, and continue to demand the release of the 101 hostages still held captive in Gaza, including, of course, Emily Damari, the last British citizen in Gaza. Because the value of standing and being counted, of being proud of who we are and what we stand for, sends a powerful message to everyone in this country, a message of hope and of commitment to Israel. So whilst with heavy hearts we say, Yehi Zichron Baruch, may their memories be a blessing, we also say with a strong voice, Am Yisrael Chai. I would like to call on the organizers of this event. Thank you so much for so many of you being here today. It's the end of this memorial and memorial event. 
uh, very emotional afternoon for all. I would like to thank the CST and the police and for Mark for all their help today. Thank you for keeping us safe. I'd like to thank the organisers, not to name them all, but the numerous speakers we've had today, especially the ones who've come from Israel and afar. Thank you to all our supporters and partners who made today possible and who continue to fight every day. And of course, to all of you for coming out on this cold, wet day. <laughs> it's a pleasure. I love my community. I love my allies. It means so much to be here with you. Please have a safe journey home, a happy and healthy new year. I wish you well over the past. And please take your rubbish with you. <laughs> Bless you all. And if you go out, have the words, bring them home on your lips, because that's the most important thing. Bring them home. Hello, we are here in Hyde Park, London. Kufai has participated in the memorial event for the 7th of October uh, terrorist attacks. And we were part of this event. It's just concluded now. It's been a very moving afternoon here with around 30,000 uh, people, many from the Jewish community, uh, but also from the non-Jewish community as well. So good to see so many Christians here as well, standing with the Jewish people. This has been an occasion where we have reflected on those uh, awful terrorist attacks of the 7th of October in Israel. We have been remembering the victims of those attacks. We have been thinking and praying for the hostages that are still held captive in Gaza. And we have been reflecting on the impact of that day that really did change Israel and changed the world. And it was such a privilege to be a part of this. We had so many uh, members of the Jewish community come to the table and thank Kufai for the stand. And when I say Kufai, we recognize that we're representing Christians from across the country that stand with Israel. And so we were we were very keen to make that clear to the members of the Jewish community that visited the table that, look, we represent tens of thousands of Christians that stand with the Jewish community. Uh, that was our message. And so it was a real encouragement. Uh, I trust that we were also encouragement to them. We engaged with so many people who came to our table. And uh, yes, it has been a very moving event. And I think the message also is that this is not over for Israel or for the Jewish community. Anti-Semitism has trebled since the 7th of October. It is at record levels. And of course, the fight for Israel in the tyranny that is trying to wipe out Israel, wipe out the Jewish people, that is ongoing. So yes, we remember 12 months ago, that tragedy, that awful, horrific day, the worst uh, massacre of Jews since the Holocaust. And we also reaffirm our commitment to stand with Israel and the Jewish people. <laughs>